Okay, I think we'll start. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to your Women in Wholesale Breakfast Briefing today. We have Ruth Fawcett, the Associate Director of Wholesale and Convenience at Coca-Cola Euro Pacific Partners with us today. Ruth has almost 20 years experience at Coca-Cola and in that time she has had 10 promotions. She works with some of the UK's biggest wholesalers and retailers and she has a lot of experience on how to bring her team with her in her success. Ruth is going to spend half the session sharing her story and the other half will be open to a Q&A. So please pop your questions into the chat box or raise your hand if you'd like to uh, share them verbally. Thanks very much. That's all from me. Over to you, Ruth. Thanks, Ellie. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, good morning. Um, and thank you for that um, introduction, Ella. That was uh, really appreciated. Um, I'm just going to um, share my screen um, quickly. Um, and I wanted to just use this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about how I lead teams and how I see um, those teams uh, kind of working, some of the top tips that I have, but then also um, some kind of a, some of the experiences of, as I go along the way. So let me just share my screen. Hopefully this is now working. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay, great stuff. Um, so um, just if I think about that question, how to lead teams and gain support for ideas, um, I don't really think that's an easy task, um, but it can be extremely rewarding um, when you get it right. Now, I think there's lots of tips and strategies that you can go and read up on. There's lots of things that are available, um, obviously, on the Internet or in books, etc. cetera. Um, but what I wanted to do when I was given this opportunity to, to take you through this was to talk about my journey and, most importantly, some of those learnings that I've taken along the way. Um, I've got a few tips, um, some that you maybe could use um, within your um, in your roles, etc., in order to be successful, and hopefully within your leadership journey as well. Now, um, as Elliot alluded to, um, there is the chat function. So if there are some questions that you have as we go along, I'm more than happy to answer those questions as well. So I'd really like this to be an interactive session. Um, and there has been a few questions that have been asked previously. So I will be looking to interject those into the sessions. But please make sure that, um, as I say, if there is anything you've got any questions or queries on, and um, that you raise those. And, and I know Alec will help facilitate um, that session. So just moving then very quickly on to um, me and where I kind of started. So um, I started my career um, at the um, very tender young age of 21, um, after I left university as a hotel and catering manager. Um, and I did a hotel and catering management degree. Um, but I then decided that that probably wasn't the route I wanted to go down as a career. Um, and moved into sales and I got my first job with Tree Bar Bassett where I spent probably about two years on the road um, as a field sales um, independent coverage representative selling um, suites um, to all the independent convenience outlets and then moved quickly on to Britvic so I did that about two years at Britvic and then subsequently then went on to Isle of Foods um, for yes again another two years where I um, spent selling own label milk um, and also Lurpak. Um, and it was at that point then, um, I then moved to Coca-Cola Enterprises, as, as it was known then. Um, and I've been there ever since. I've been there just under, just over 19 years now. Um, and those 19 years have been spent across various roles within the business, whether that be retail, whether that be convenience, wholesale. Um, I've also managed quite a big, some large teams in field sales as well. Um, and then subsequently, I'm now the Associate Director for Wholesale and Convenience, managing some of our biggest customers. And I think the um, picture on the right hand side probably is quite apt because I think the journey that you have as an individual is your journey. And I think you should be really clear on where you want to go from and to um, as a career and be really clear on what's important to you. Um, if I cast my mind back probably about 10 years to think, would I be in the position that I'm in? I'd probably say that wasn't in the plan. Um, but I think it's important that you recognise the journey that you are on and be adaptable and flexible. Um, and that that helps you to get to where you need to be. So if I look at my leadership journey in particular, um, it's probably the last seven years that my leadership journey has progressed. Um, and I've progressed in a number of roles. Um, I've moved actually eight times in senior roles and I've had two promotions. Um, and I've managed from anywhere from between two to 100 people. Um, but the principles are still the same, whether it's two or it's 100. Um, and I think it's important that you recognise that as a leader, that um, it's, it's as important to, to have um, the same kind of approach and technique 
when you're managing one or two people as you have for over 100. Um, and that time, though, I've actually done six senior roles and I've done um, two associate director roles within, within Coca-Cola um, Euro-Pacific partners. Um, and I work nationally across those areas. And if I think back really to my first role, um, when I started being a leader within the business, I think I was probably guilty of um, thinking that I could influence a team, that I could bring the team with me, and that they would really feel the same way that I did. Plus, I knew everything and I needed to know everything. Um, and I think that became very clear that that was probably not the right approach. And whilst I did get some results, I recognised there was a much better way of being transformational as a leader. And that's really helped me to rely more heavily on encouragement, support to motivate and inspire others where team members really do feel valued um, and motivate to contribute to their best. Um, and I think the piece there is it really sets up uh, the foundation for a collaborative and productive team dynamic. Now, at Coca-Cola Europe Pacific Partners, we have a mantra of everyone's welcome. We also have a program which is called Just Be. Um, and that program, this is basically, it is what it says. It's, it's around just being, just being who you are um, and bringing your true self to work. And I think we've probably all been guilty at some time of probably coming to work and thinking we need to be a certain persona or we need to be a certain way. Um, and I think that mantra that we have at Coca-Cola Europe Pacific Partners is really building the right culture and it really recognises that individuals are individuals. And you as an individual, as a leader, you need to make sure that you're um, driving that agenda most effectively. Now, I don't know if some of you are aware of Insights, um, which is where it's basically a, a profile which helps you to understand where your preferences are, how you think, how you operate. You're maybe quite data driven or you could be more ideation driven. Um, but that's a really good way. And if you've got an opportunity to do Insights within um, your business, I would recommend that you do that. Um, because it helps you to understand who you are as an individual, also helps you to understand who your team is, um, and therefore then you can flex accordingly and adapt in order to get the best out of them. So I think that's probably uh, top tip number one as we move forward. So as I say, I've had a leadership journey for around seven years, but um, I think probably the four areas here are the, are the ones that I would probably lead with, with every team that I've managed. And I've, I find that these are the most effective so the first is about being really clear on the direction and vision. Um, how many times has, have you probably had somebody that's asked you to do something, but you're not really 100% sure of the why? And the why is so important. Um, so you really do as a leader need to share a vision so that people really know what you're trying to accomplish and a why. And that keeps them really focused and motivated. Um, and people really don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. So it's really important to explain that why element and what's the purpose. Um, and I think that in itself is probably the biggest um, gain that I know I've had over the years, especially managing teams of 100 people within field sales. By explaining the why, making everybody clear on the reason that we need to achieve something or do something different or change something um, really helps those individuals. Um, and I think that that for me is, is, is probably one of the key areas. If we then work on to team, um, as you are all on the call, you probably know a team is a group of individuals that are all interdependent parts and that work together to achieve a common goal. But I found as a leader, you need to foster that culture of teamwork and collaboration among the team members. Um, and you need to create opportunities for them, um, ask their opinion, share ideas, learn from each other and use the power of the team because it's an extremely powerful thing. Um, if I take my last team, um, all pretty well established, all had some experience, but it was really important that recognised and leveraged their strengths, but also identified their development areas and um, looked at ways in which we could all collectively grow together. And I think that in itself is, is pretty powerful. And um, so teamwork and really recognising the strengths of the team and the areas that you need to develop are absolutely key um, on bringing people on that leadership journey. Um, feedback is absolutely key. It's what matters. Um, you know, I think I think we all improve if we get feedback. Um, but I think the most important thing here is that it's really constructive feedback. So I, I'm sure you've probably all been as as I have like in over my time in work, where somebody's giving you feedback, and the feedback could just be as simple as, "Yeah, you're doing great." Um, and I think that in itself is not really constructive feedback. Feedback needs to be recognised and appreciated. Um, and it also needs to be 
um, consistent um, in the approach that you're taking. Now, I've got a couple of areas that I've had a little bit of success and it might sound a little bit cheesy actually, but um, um, one of the things I do for the team is give them a bit of praise because I think it's important that you don't just say thank you to people, you also make sure that they're, they're recognised for the work that they do. Um, and I've, I've done this in the past where I've sent cards to the team that just tell them how amazing they are. Um, and actually writing a personal note in them to say, you know, kind of what they've achieved in that quarter or what they've achieved in the month. Um, it just reminds them that when they're having a tough day or maybe things aren't going as planned, that in actual fact, there is there are days that have actually been really, really productive. And that's that's had a, a great response from the team. Um, and I think it's important, as I say, that you give feedback, but you also give praise. And then the final piece there is um, Ruth, can I stop you? Um, Ruth, we have a question. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we've got a question. Could you give an example of a why when you're asking a team to sell more or deliver more? So you can't you can't really say that the why is we need to make more money because it's not very inspiring. So how do we deliver a more empowering message around the why? OK, so. I think I think the why is always kind of thinking about what the longer term goal is. So, yes, you maybe want to deliver a more profitable um, outcome at the end of it. But it's then also thinking about the why and the behavior that that actually drives Elliot. So um, if I was thinking around, you know, if, you, if you're in business and you go, I actually want to deliver this performance measure. I then think about the, the knock on impact of delivering that performance measure. So if we deliver a strong performance, what is the result of that performance? So does it actually mean that from a from a if you know if you're in a business where there's shares, that the, from a shareholder perspective, that actually means that the the total business performance is, is is there. If it's from an individual perspective, could it be around the team and how the team is performing? So the team objective is actually achieved. So always think about the next thing. So it's not just about hitting that performance measure it's about thinking what the knock-on impact is and how that therefore then delivers does that answer the question um this um hopefully that answers the question it was an anonymous question so i don't know who it came from but i, I it sounds like a very thorough answer to me great thank you and we've got a couple more actually we've got a couple yeah, of raised right. hands let's have a look at this so yes it did answer the question it's just a thank you very much great thank you thank you i think it's I think the why is always an important thing. So if I take my mind back to um, field sales, um, and I always remember we were looking at ways in which we were changing how we activated in grocery accounts. Um, and we were changing something that had been in place for quite a long time. Um, and I think it's important that you recognize why you're changing it, but also then give people a reason to believe. I think that's absolutely key is giving people a reason to believe. Um, and that in actual fact, the longer term gain is going to be far better. So I think it's 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 not just about doing what you're doing in that moment. It's that it's that longer term vision that, that's probably really powerful. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, Nick, Nikki and Trudy, we have your hands up. Would you. Yes. Would you like to ask a question, Nikki? Or Trudy, we've enabled your talk, talk function if you'd like to. Hello there. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hello, yes. good morning. Yes, I can hear you. You say uh, about teamwork uh, and getting them behind you. Um, and I understand that you have to share your vision to get the um, get the best out of them. But when you have one member in the team that feel... Uh, you can have the scenario where you have one member of the team that isn't on board shall I say it nicely on board, um, what would you suggest rather than, um, you know, uh, to get them included into it, to make them, I'm, I'm struggling with one person, uh, very good at her work and very good at um, doing what we ask her to do and how, why, and I've explained why we do the work we do, um, but I'm struggling for the negativity from her to get rid of the negativity from her so a little tip please yeah that, you know what that's a really really good question because you can have um, one little spoil it all you see yeah you, yeah and i think that's a really great question and especially um you don't always get everybody at the same place um mm -hmm. i always start with the point of that you may not get everybody to 100 percent of the idea but i think if you can get the mindset to think that 90 percent is there 
that's mm. a really good start point is to kind of get people onto that journey yeah um i think the first thing is don't single that person out because they're you know you know within the group because that that probably therefore then is um probably a, a probably a negative approach and the approach i would take with that is ask their opinion of what they think we could they could do differently or what are some of the barriers that they see to the um, proposal that you put in place and actually have some really open questions with that individual to really try and understand what really their barriers are to to change um, and ask, ask their opinion because they may have some mm -hmm. ideas that you maybe have considered as well um, that you can maybe therefore then factor in and then you bring them on the journey with you. That's um, probably the best approach I would take. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That I'll try that. I, I will try that. But as I say, I don't like to... Um individually bring them out but if I can it's just so hard when you have one negative person isn't it and yeah 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 it, it, but, it's a hard one but I think mm. if you if you ask their opinion yeah. for maybe what they would do differently or if they you know there's obviously an area that you're not 100% convinced with just help me understand why yes. that's that's a barrier at the moment you then get an idea of maybe what some of the barriers are and sometimes it's it's not necessarily, it's maybe there's just their perception of something rather than the reality of it. Um, but mm. I would I would just have that conversation because it can be quite disruptive then to getting mm. um, the longer term goal, goal, goal and game that you're looking for. Thank you, thank you. No problem at all. Any more questions at this stage? Not at the moment. Okay, well, I'll move on to that. And, um, so those are the four fundamentals that I work within. Um, and I think, as I say, empowerment is really key. Um, and that comes on to the point where um, if you actually empower your team um, and get their opinions, um, which is quite apt, actually, if you empower your team and get their opinions, um, it gives the team authority and autonomy and, and the resources really to make decisions and take action. So um, one of the things that I always do if I'm looking to uh, make a change is bring those individuals with me in the conversation. And I start at a place where I talk to them all individually. Um, and ask their opinion on what they think um, so that I get a collective view. And if I've got a consensus, then that probably really helps. If I've got very differing views, then that's probably a slightly different challenge. Um, but by actually bringing people on that journey, what that then allows them to do is feel really empowered that they've been part of that decision making process. And therefore, then there's a real ownership um, to that initiative and it really helps those individuals. So I think if you really make sure those kind of top four proper conditions really um, are there within the business what happens is is that people feel really proud about the work that they do they become a little bit more creative um, and actually from a work-life perspective it becomes a little bit more balanced and everybody is happy um, and I think that's that's really important because we want people to be happy and content when they're when they're in a working environment um, but I suppose the question that as I say was on the on the sheet was very much around how to gain support so you might have those fundamental basics there in place so if you think about it you've got your big idea which you've shared you've influenced them as a leader and you've explained the why the team are working well together so they've got good teamwork there's a there's a you know good camaraderie they feel empowered and valued but they're not really supporting that change on your idea to implement um, and I've probably got four areas here that um, I would then look to implement so hopefully this again will answer and the question from pre previous I work on a principle of three C's, which is communication, collaboration, and commitment. Um, if you get the right communication, you then get the right collaboration, you get the right commitment. If at any point any of one of those three breaks down, you then have to circle back round and go to the start. So if you've got the communication, but the collaboration isn't there, then you have to question the communication that you've just given. If you've got the collaboration, but they haven't given you the commitment, you've then probably not given the right communication in the first place. So you have to recircle. And that's a really good way of kind of just testing as a leader. If you've got all those three correct, then you will bring people with you and you gain the support. Um, and as I said earlier, it's about bringing people on the journey. It's allowing individuals to have ideas and input. And it's so important because, again, they feel valued. They feel as though they've part, been part of that decision making process. It builds really good rapport with the team because they all feel as though they've had an input and you gain their trust and respect as well. So that, that's really, really key. Um, the more approachable you are as a, as a leader on listening and actively listening, and I think that's something we're probably all guilty of. We listen, but we probably don't actively listen um, and show genuine interest um, to their ideas and, and suggestions. Um, and maybe challenge a little bit along the way as well. Um, I think that, that's really key. 
Um, and I use a technique, which is most of you probably will hear, which is the five whys. If you can't answer the five whys, so keep asking the why, um, then, uh, you, you know, if, they, if people can't get to that place, then they maybe just need to recircle back round. Um, allow team members to problem solve as well. Um, give them a problem and ask them to go away and come back with a solution um, because that really helps them to propose their ideas and gives them the empowerment and they think creatively. And mm -hmm. you could actually come up with an idea that you haven't thought about um, and the team team really feel really empowered by that. Uh, make sure they've got some resources as well um, because it's important that you as a, a leader provide them with the tools and resources that if they need extra input or they need another area of the business that you're there as a leader to help them to do that. I mean, it keeps you accountable, so it keeps you accountable to where you need to be. Um, and then keep the eye on the big picture because I think that's really important. So um, make sure that people are very clear on what the North Star is. Make sure you're very clear on what the non-negotiables are that um, you need to steer to um, and keep that, in, keep that in check. Um, and the final piece there is show a bit of flexibility and vulnerability. Um, as a leader, it's not always about you knowing all the answers. Um, and I think if you um, do get, you know, something wrong or you you, you, you don't actually know the response to something, you need to go and, and find that. I think that that just shows your authenticity as a leader and um, that you are you are vulnerable and that at times that you've got that flexibility and you're able to do that um, as, as a leader in that t in that team. Um, and I think I think the final piece then for me, is there any questions on that piece before I move on to the, the kind of the final slide? I can't see any questions at the moment. No? Okay. Good stuff. Um, and then the final piece for me is, um, I just kind of wanted to put this slide up here. Um, now, that's me at Christmas um, as a leader of 100 people in field sales. Um, and every year what we do is we go out Christmas merchandising. Now, I couldn't find uh, the picture of me um, probably about seven years ago when I first did my first ever video um, to a team. The difference between the two, though, is quite significant. Um, and the first, the first picture was a, a myself. I, I was literally in a suit and talking to the team um, and having a conversation with them, and, and, and basically saying these, these are the things we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. Um, this picture is me, as I say, at the Christmas merchandising, where I'm sat in the car, wishing them all a merry Christmas, thanking them for the work for the year, um, and being um being myself and i think that's the key message here is to be really authentic um being a leader starts with you it starts with who you are and recognizing and understanding what you really stand for as an individual and i'd really ask you to all question yourselves on that to go do you really do you really bring your true self to work or is there a little bit of a screen there and i think if you're genuinely authentic then you'll reap all the rewards um, of leading a, a good team um i then look at how I can grow the team. I kind of just want to leave you with these messages, how you grow the team. So I always start from a place of 100% trust. Um, there's been a lot of um, training courses that I go on that that talk about how you earn trust. Um, start at 100%. There's no reason why somebody um, is not going to be at 100%. Um, and I think if you, if you start there, it means that you're really clear. Um, people have got good areas and ideas of responsibility and targets. And you always have to assume that they want to be there. So start 100% trust. Give the team space. Um, so believe in co-creation. Build, build together. Don't just assign. Don't just tell somebody what you want them to do. Ask them um, and invest in those individuals um, emotionally as well, because I think that's really important. Find out about what makes them the person that they are. Um, and then really believe in that culture. Um, um, I do think people turn to workplace um, that feels like a real community. They turn up to that workplace. Um, and they bring themselves to work every day. Um, they want to have a voice, they want to feel, they want to be counted and they want to add value. Um, and I think if you recognize that, then that helps you to bring people with you. And then the final piece, and, and some of you may have seen this before, but um, as a leader, you, you, you all have a shadow that you cast, um, and whether that's within an organization, and that can either be positive or negative, um, but that shadow can really strengthen a company's culture and the engagement and commitment of its employees. The question I want to probably leave you with is, what's your shadow saying about you? And that concludes the presentation. Um, and I know that we've got a bit of Q&A, haven't we, Elliot? So uh, yeah. do you want me to stop sharing at the moment? Does that help? Then we come off yeah, share. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, stop sharing. How do I do that then? <laughs> oh, um, um, just a second. Do that. Does that stop sharing? There we go. 
there we go. Stop so we don't, I mean, I've got a few questions I'd really like to ask. Actually, yeah. Je, Je, let's let's put Gemma's question first. So Gemma's saying, any tips on how to find each team member's motivators? Oh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, the first thing is, it's very simple. It's probably just to ask what motivates an individual. Um, um, I tend to have regular one-to-ones with um, all my team members. So I'll have a kind of a monthly catch-up or bi-monthly catch-up. Um, and part of that session will always be around, um, we'll talk about performance, but then we always talk about what motivates them as an individual. Um, and, you know, you can have some elements that are, you know, some people may be really motivated by um, kind of monetary values, et cetera, or incentives. And then there's other individuals that potentially it's more about um, how a role makes them feel or the fact that they've got an opportunity to change. But the tip really would be just to spend the time and just ask some really open questions because most people want to tell you what's important to them and what their values are and, and what are the things that they're really um, passionate about. I think most people want to, want to share that information with you. Thank you. I think you'd be surprised sometimes what motivates people. I, I've, I've come across stories where someone received a pay rise and they, they weren't very happy with it. But once their job title changed, they were over the moon. Everyone's motivated. You'd be surprised by what people are motivated by. Carrie says, uh, and this is a really good question. When you arrive in a team that has a culture of negativity, how do you turn it around? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, that I've, I've actually had that experience where the team has been um, quite negative um, in the approach. Um, or that potentially they've had um they've maybe had managers previously that have, have, have built kind of very different culture um and that's quite a challenge because obviously that there's a mindset shift that needs to needs to change um but i use a technique which is called and it's, it's basically traffic lights it's stop look and listen so i i just basically i go out with the team i go out with every team member um and i will spend time with them just to get their opinion on what's working what's not what what are the things that they would like to change what are the things that they'd like to do differently um and what i mean by stop look and listen is not to make any assumptions not to start to put anything into place but just to really look and listen and actively listen to those individuals and really understand what are some of the common themes um, and then what i then do is i bring the team together and i share my observations with them around what they've told me, what I've seen, and therefore then what are the probably the, the, the running trends. What I then do is I then have a session where I'll work with the team to go, how do we how do we actually change this? So what what are the things that we like currently? What are the things that we don't like as a collective team and what do we want to be what do we want to do differently? And that that approach tends to work. Um, and I have turned teams around by um, kind of taking them on that journey but it is a journey you've got to take them on um and you may not get everybody on the on the bus at the same time um but again to the to the question that was raised earlier it's about understanding why those in why maybe an individual isn't is it isn't coming with you on that journey and recognizing that they're not on that journey as well so i think it's it's you know that's probably the best way i would i would i would, I would approach that area that's brilliant thank you so much um we have Another question here. Is there one piece of advice that you would give yourself back at the start of your leadership journey? And that's come from Maria. Yes, I probably would actually. Um, and I think there's, there's two actually. Being really self-aware is absolutely key. So understanding who you are as an individual and what is important to you, I think is is kind of a priority. Um, and I think it, it, it comes back to the... Um, the, the picture that I raised at the end is just be authentic, be you. Um, I think I think we can spend a lot of our working life um, thinking we need to be a certain way, thinking we need to talk a certain way, thinking we need to act a certain way. I think if you are genuinely authentic um, and you are um, you bring your true self to work, then that is that actually it reaps rewards, and I, I would recommend that. So I think that probably would be the advice I'd give myself if I if I started again. Brilliant, thank you. And Sarah is asking, how would you approach encouraging self-sufficiency in a team that has a high level of reliance on your input? Mm. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that you're saying that um, they, they're quite self-sufficient, um, that they therefore then still require 
kind of leadership or guidance from their manager is that is that the question sorry Zara are you happy to share your question in a bit more detail let me yeah. uh let's have a look if we can just be good just to make sure that I answer it correctly for Zara I can't quite um, put Zara on microphone. Would you like to add any more details, Zara? Great, Zara's going to follow up with you. Okay, that's great. I just want to make sure that I answer that correctly for, for Zara. So we have Daria who said that uh, as a business, they've been through lots of difficult and uncertain times. What's your advice on leading teams in times of crisis and managing change and keeping yeah. the team motivated? Yikes. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's probably, um, if I cast my mind back, and we'll all, we'll all remember this is um, two years ago, um, COVID hit, which was probably, probably one of the biggest crisis management times that most people will have had at, at, at that point. Um, and it goes back to probably those three Cs. It's, it's communication, uh, collaboration, commitment. Um, and the first thing is to over-communicate. So if I think back to crisis management time, of we had field sales teams out on the, in trade. We were um, obviously working and operating. Um, people were very nervous about what was happening um, and obviously health risks, et cetera. Um, and it was very important that we over-communicated what the processes were going to be, what the impact was going to be, how we were going to manage that, what we we're going to do very, very differently. Um, and I spent a full year uh, managing a team on Teams because we were literally on lockdown. We couldn't go into any of the outlets um, that we wanted to. Um, and that in itself is, is probably quite challenging. Um, but I think the key to it is, is over-communicate. That's the first thing, is make sure that everybody's clear. Be clear on the processes that you're going to put in place so that um, everybody's got full clarity on what the expectations are and what that needs to look like. And then put things in place that help to motivate the team. So if I think back to Teams calls, for example, we were doing things on Teams that we probably would never, ever have done um, if we were in a face-to-face -face environment or in trade. So things like putting group sessions in the, um, you know, from Friday conversations, making sure that well-being is, um, you know, factored into that as well making sure that people have regular touch points and that that weren't isolated was absolutely key. Um, and I think just by having those processes in place and making sure that you're helping them on that journey and you're recognising as well, because uh, I think Teams is quite a good way of recognising if you've maybe got somebody that isn't particularly engaging, is recognising them on that call, but then picking up with them afterwards just to check in with them and make sure that everything's okay. There's lots of little things that you can do that brings people um, on that journey, keep them motivated when, when you're in that crisis management situation. And I think COVID was probably a really good example of that. Thank you, Ruth. Zara, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you are able to speak now if you'd like to share more. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll unmute. Hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, we can. Thanks very Barbara. much. Hi there. Um, so for a bit of context, there's a, there's a mix um, for me in terms of, um, roles and responsibilities I manage a team of four at the moment um I think the key thing for me is um there's a level of potentially um confidence that could be built on and and what I find is I try and make myself available um at all times but it lends itself to being f almost fallen back on and and um I, I think I kind of it, it's it's a key balance to find I think not being too unavailable but being too available and then not encouraging that you know, going out and, and finding the answer for themselves. I don't know if you've got anything, any tips to help encourage that a bit more without being sort of unavailable. Yeah. So is, is it more a case of that your team aren't being as self-sufficient as you would like? And yeah. And you want them yeah. to be a little bit more proactive in um, going and finding information or not necessarily relying on you to give them the answer? Absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, probably my biggest tip there is that um, when you, the first the first point is if you do get an individual that constantly phones you and is asking for your advice on something my usual my usual tip is to flick that around and ask them what they think they should do in the first instance so if somebody's phoning you and saying i don't know the answer to this or i need some help on this area 
I'd probably flick that back and go, how, um, you know, what do you think? What do you think the option, what, what options have you got? What do you think the answer is, et cetera, et cetera. Because that then helps them to start thinking and being a little bit more self-sufficient in their, in their own thought process. Um, I think another way of doing that is buddying up the team. Um, so you can actually, if you've got a team of four, can you buddy um, one of the individuals up with one of the other members that's maybe more, um, has got more knowledge or more understanding of the business and therefore then they're their go-to to help to support and they do it as a collaborative way. That's another really quick and easy way. Um, and I think the other the other piece is then if there are area, our areas that you want those individuals to exceed on is put some training courses in with them um, and take them through maybe some of the areas that you're constantly getting asked questions on. Um, so therefore then it, it helps them to understand that there is a there's a self-serve that they can go and do themselves. Does that help? So, yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. That's very clear. We have a couple of similar questions, actually. What's the best team building event that you've run, that you've run and, and why? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I actually, um, I did a team build um, it's a few years back um, and it wasn't, it wasn't particularly a, um, it wasn't an elaborate team build, but we did a team build where um, we did a treasure hunt in um, a little town in the north called Richmond and um, basically we put the team we, I had a team of about 10 people at the time we put them into teams of three and they had to go and do a treasure hunt in um, this in this in, in this small village in Richmond um, which meant them going and um, collecting data and have a little bit of a competition against each other um, I probably would say that was probably one of the best um, team builds because it just brought the team together because they worked as individuals but they also had to then work as a really as a collective team all together. They had a lot of fun along the way. They learned a lot about each other as well. Um, and I know the feed and I, I always used to get feedback from the sessions because um, it was it's important that you do get feedback. And the feedback the team gave me was that they they thoroughly enjoyed that kind of team build, which was it was fun, but it helped them to understand what their strengths and their opportunities were as a team and then we, we, we kind of digested that afterwards um, and identified what we could do as a total team together going forward so I think that probably was a um, whilst it was um, not necessarily a, a, a typical um, you know kind of let's go and build a, a boat kind of a, a team build it was, it was one that brought the team together and really made them recognize who where the strengths were. Thank you we're getting a lot of questions um, do you need a drink of water before the next one? I'm fine. Don't worry. I'm okay. You are <laughs> raring, great, though, raring it's, to it's, go. It's great. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Vicky, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I have uh, unmuted, unmuted yeah. you if, if you'd like to share your question. Vicky, we can hear some background noise. Yep. Carry yeah. on. But I'll, I'll try and ask. I'll try and, uh, and, and make it quick. Um, I have a, a member of my team who's right. Oh, she's lovely, lovely individual. Um, however, she can be quite negative and has the tendency to use quite a lot of passive aggressive comments. These are usually around when she's being asked to travel for work. So, we, you know, this is the industry that we all work in. We know when we start the role that there is an expectation to travel to your customer, potentially stay overnight. Um, I'm aware of it when there's a busier time, such as now with the the, uh, the industry that we work in, there are awards nights and galas and stuff, and I try to be accommodating. Um, she's a single parent, but she has split custody with her husband, and I, you know, I'm very sympathetic to that to that restriction. Um, but the passive aggressive comments about being away from home and and not seeing her children, and then on top of that, how busy she is. I'm so busy it's just so busy at the moment I don't have chance to do things and I've tried to speak to her about let's discuss how the role is and, and what you're doing to try to understand what making her busy but quite honestly I, I don't get it and I don't see the output her mm -hmm. colleague has done her role before so knows what's happening and, and we're all I'm away even more than she is her colleagues are away as much as she is and it kind of brings everybody down because it feels like they're she's insinuating that they're not busy and they're not as struggling as much yeah. as she is and just find it really difficult to overcome this sort of passive aggressive comments without actually just saying look you're not the only one in this situation and being blunt yeah it's, I, I think um, 
Uh, yeah, so I think that I think there's an element there. Um, I think first and foremost is probably giving it some really constructive feedback, so picking the time and and just saying, look, um, these this, this is happening. This has now happened on numerous occasions. I really would like to have a conversation with you about how maybe the comments that you are making, the impact it's having, and it's the mm-hmm. behaviour. So it's not about the person; it's the behaviour. So I think if you if you maybe book some time in with her to go. The knock on impact today, of you making those comments <laughs> actually has a real impact on the rest of the team. And that's been becoming quite noticeable. So I'd like to understand, A, why you're making those comments. And secondly, is there something that we something that's not working in the role that you're currently doing at this moment in time that we need to therefore then start to have a look and address? Um, that's probably a really good way of looking, is it is a really good way of just focus really on the behavior, not on the person. Because the circumstances at home are circumstances at home. Um, and most people try to be flexible. And I think, I think you just got to be really clear on the expectations that, you know, if we are, you are going to be expected to be away two nights a week. If that therefore then becomes a challenge in the role that you're doing, then maybe this is not the right role for you because ultimately those are the, re- those are the requirements of the job. Um, but I think it's, it's really focused on the behaviour and then the impact that is adding on the rest of the team, which is probably with, would be the approach that I would take. Brilliant, thank you, Ruth. Stephanie's got wow. a really good. Stephanie's got a really good question, actually, and I've um, you you can share it verbally if you like, Stephanie. Um, yeah, mine is just around having difficult conversations. I have an incredibly strong team. We are a small team. We're a group of really passionate individuals. Everybody seems really happy, really motivated. I really struggle in my own life. So being authentically me, this is me. I will go to any length to avoid conflict, confrontation, challenge, not comfortable with it at all. Um, So for me, it's about how I can have those difficult conversations without getting, quite frankly, myself into a total tears about it, because I know that I take things personally. Some of my team are much the same. So for me, it's that thing of, is there a a technique or a way around it that we can just make it easier for everybody? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I actually think it's, it's such a good question is that because I think most people don't want to have difficult conversations. Nobody likes to have a difficult conversation. Um, I think if the world, if the world could be a, a, a nice place every single day, then I think we'd probably all take that, at, you know, 100% of the time. Um, but difficult conversations, unfortunately, in the in the industry that we work in and we, within any industry that you work in, um, there will be a time when difficult conversations need to be had. Um, and I think it's it's about you feeling comfortable about those those difficult conversations, but probably looking at ways in which you can approach it. So, you know, like I just spoke earlier about giving feedback and just picking the right time to think about the feedback. It's as important to prep for that difficult conversation as it is to actually have the conversation. And I think that would be my first start point um, is that is is actually writing down why you're having that conversation with that individual and what are the facts. Um, because sometimes you can probably go into a into a conversation and not be prepared yourself. And then you don't know what the outcome of or what the expectation of that individual is or what potential they're going to come back with. So just like you would prep for a, maybe a business meeting or um, maybe a pitch to a customer, for example, um, you need to prep very much for a difficult conversation and take it as um, it's part of the process. So um, sit down, work out why there's a challenge. So again, f- focus on facts, focus on the behaviours, focus on the impact that that individual is having. But then also think about the location that you maybe want to have that conversation with the individual um because that's that's again so important it's about making sure it's in the right timed approach and that you've actually blocked the right amount of timing um and then i think sometimes it's always important to start with kind of really open questions with an individual to kind of get a feeling of what they think so if you've experienced something within the team that you know probably maybe um maybe an individual has done something you're not 100 happy with or that you you therefore then need to address is get them to tell you what they think has happened um, and, and how maybe their actions have actually impacted others. Um, and then that, that actually helps the conversation because it helps you along the way. But 
and you, you're probably never going to get away from the factor that you're not going to like having a difficult conversation. I don't think anybody likes to have a difficult conversation. It's just how you try and manage it in that way. That's really helpful. Thank you. It's proof that the way I tackle it is the right way, um, yeah. which makes me feel a hundred times better because, you know, if, if it doesn't, if it goes well, great. If it doesn't go well, you beat yourself up that yeah. you could have handled it better. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I don't think, I think the thing is, um, you never know how other people are going to react. That's the reality of it. You, 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 you can plan for the best in the world, but you're never going to know how somebody's going to react. But I think it's the the piece that's important is to go, look, I know that I prepped this in the right way and I've had the right conversation. If, however, it doesn't go as I expected it to go, you then can you then go back to where you go back to kind of your planning and go, right, what could I have done differently? And therefore, then what do I do the next time? And as long as you learn from that, then that's that's all that anybody can really ask. But it you know, difficult conversations are that you know, they are difficult conversations and um it's, it doesn't come easy to anybody, I don't think. I think I think most people will, will, you know, because we're human beings and we we feel, and I think that's the thing we feel. That's really reassuring. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ruth. Trudy, did you have another question? You have your hand up. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. No, I didn't have my uh, my hand up, but I did ask a question about. I just wanted to know. Um, do you on a. a your me time I mean I know we're talking about teams and things but we have to remember that we have other lives <laughs> and I just wondering what just basically what you do for your me time and um do you beat yourself up about it because I tend to have a me time but then afterwards I feel oh I should have not had that you know not done that I feel a bit guilty about it so I was just yeah. wondering what how you yeah so I am um, I I like to make sure that I plan time in my diary so that I have time I actually like to have thinking time because if I don't have thinking time I don't function particularly well so mm -hmm. I always plan in my diary at least half an afternoon uh, once a week where I block that time out and that's time for me to think about the things that are really important where the longer term planning needs to be what are the key objectives that I want to be driving you know where where the team is currently at this moment in time what are the things that we need to be thinking about I think that's really important but you know, you've got to make time in your diary. Um, I know we all say that we're busy, but we're only busy because maybe somebody else has put something into the diary. I think it's important that you you you, you kind of block that diary that time out for yourself. Um, I also um, I'm quite um, I like to go to the gym and just I use that as I use that as a bit of mental thinking as well because yeah. that gives me kind of some time to think. Um, whilst listening to music, you know, kind of mull things over in my in my mind as well, which I think is important. So kind of making sure that my well-being is still very good um, and, and quite balanced is, is absolutely key. Um, and I think if something hasn't gone as I've planned, um, I tend to probably use people around me and just bounce bounce ideas as well. So I'll maybe go, look, you know, kind of if colleagues, you know, friends, et cetera, have had this situation. I've handled it this way. I'm not sure if that's the right way. And I'm not, I've come out of that in a, um, I've come out of that situation not feeling as comfortable as I would have liked. Can I get can I get your advice and maybe something I could have done differently? It's it's not always about you having the answers, and I think no. sometimes it, it gives you a bit of reassurance that maybe you've approached it the right way because your colleagues say you know say they would have done exactly the same, or they maybe give you another idea that actually allows you to think maybe differently for the next approach. So that's probably how I would look at kind of me time is make sure I've got time out in the diary, do the thing that makes you happy. Um, so if, whether that's running, yeah. jumping. Yeah. <laughs> cooking whatever wherever it's your kind of happy place so you know I always think go to your happy place that makes you makes you be the best you can be um and then use people around you because using people around you probably give you some ideas and they'll either give you the reassurance that you need or they'll give you some new ideas or a suggestion that you haven't thought about thank you Brilliant. Thank you very much. Can I just check this session is being recorded and, and if you're not comfortable with it being shared, please just let me know in the chat box because there's some incredible questions being asked and it would be fantastic to, to share this. But if anyone's not comfortable with that, please just pop it into the chat. Um, I do have a question for you, Ruth. Your career path is impressive. So my question is, do you wait for opportunities? Do you wait to be asked or do you seek them out and create your own? Um, do you know that's a really, really good question. Um, I 
I think probably in my early career, yes, I, I looked for opportunities. So I, as I say, I moved relatively quickly from various companies and then um, I landed a role at um, Coca-Cola. Um, and I probably think in my first early career path, I probably um, looked for those opportunities. So generally stayed in a role around two to th two to three years, so 18 months to, to, to two years, et cetera, and then moved, moved within the business. Um, and then I think probably in the last few years, um, whilst there's been some definite um, kind of opportunities that I've, I've looked for, um, there's also been ones that have been created. But I think the one thing that I would take from it is, um, yes, I've done quite a lot of moves in the last few years. It's probably some of those have been because we've done some restructures and, and I've had an input though into the role that I do. So I think that's really important. It's, you know, I've had an input. It's not a case of that those roles have been given um, or, or moved across. It's, it, there's really been an input. Um, but I'm also, I think it's important that you do look for those opportunities for breadth um, because I think they they allow you to just have a much wider conversation. So um, what's really important to me is that, you know, I need to I need to feel as though I can drive change in a role. It, it's important that I feel as though that I can um, have an impact and that I can really um, kind of bring some value to that position. And I think that's been really important. So I've created some. Some have been probably created because of, changes within within the in, within the organization etc um but ultimately it's it, it is about making sure that you're making the right choices as well okay and how do you make your own team feel energized and, and motivated it must be quite difficult if you get up in the morning and you're not you're not having a good day but you you, you have to turn up and motivate 14 people yeah um, I'm quite, I, I am quite, uh, as I said, anybody that's done insights, I am, uh, I'm quite a sunshine yellow person. So I'm uh, um, quite motivational. And, and I know, I know some of the team members actually get their, get their energy from me, <laughs> which is quite interesting. Um, it is, you know, managing a team, it can be draining, it can, you know, it can be, um, you know, you're managing people, um, and people, you know, want to talk to people effectively, they like to talk to people. Um, how I motivate myself or how I motivate that team is that I, because I've spent the time with them and I understand what motivates them, that then becomes quite easy to do. So I know when they're having not particularly a good day, I can see that on, uh, you know, on Teams calls. I can see when maybe something's kind of worrying them. Um, because I have the regular contacts with them, it's, it's quite easy to have that conversation with them um, and help them to be motivated. Um, and we have regular check in, check ins, so um, I think that that's really important. Um, and it just helps to be able to motivate the team as you need to. Um, they're very clear on the, the the direction of where we want to get from and to. Um, we just we just help each other to get on that journey and get to where we need to be. My other question was, how do you how do you gently push people to achieve more without making them feel inadequate? It, it must be quite tricky. Because if you don't give enough feedback, you don't really. What I'm trying to say is, how do you not beat around the bush? Yeah. Um, so I think I think you don't want people to feel inadequate. I think the first thing is that you. Um, it's a really really tricky skill. Um, I don't think this is probably an easy one. Um, but there's some there's some things that you can do. So I think you know we've talked earlier about constructive feedback. Um, and I think it is very important that you you don't use generic phrases. You actually are very specific. So, um, you know, I alluded to it earlier. You know, somebody just saying, saying to you is a good job or you could do better. It doesn't really resonate with anybody. Mm. It's about going, you did a great job because of A, B, C and D. You were very professional. You delivered that presentation in a really succinct way. You found some alternatives. It's about making sure that you're really giving that constructive feedback. Um, the motivational piece is key. Um, so again, if you are um, really clear on what motivates them, whether it's around passion, whether it's around trying to understand, um, you know, if it's about, you know, financial gain, for example, or rewards, those things are really, um, really um, um, important. I think the thing where people maybe feel inadequate is you've got to start small. So I think sometimes you can, it can be a little bit overwhelming if you kind of go with a big idea um, um, or, or it's a little bit vague and it feels a little bit unattainable. I think start smaller. So look at kind of the smaller things that maybe an individual can manage and, mm. and help them and show them that it is achievable. Um, and I think that's probably quite a key one um, for me is if, you know, is, is, is how you push people is to 
break it down into bite sized chunks and, and make it make it really manageable for them. Um, and then I think there's a piece there around um, sometimes people don't always ha ask for help. So mm. um, I think sometimes they feel that they feel inadequate because they don't, they don't have the skills or the ability to be able to do this or the knowledge, but they don't feel as though they can ask. And I think the one thing that I would always do is is check in with them to go, do you feel as though you've got the skill set? And if you haven't, yeah. or you, if you don't have the understanding, how can I help you to get that? Who could help you on that journey? Is there somebody else within the business? Can we assign you a mentor? Can we help you overcome that in order to build their confidence and competence in that area? Um, and then I think, as I say, the final piece of me on that, on that Ella, is, is around um, showing what the possibilities are. So sometimes if people really can't see the wood for the trees or they're, they're kind of being a bit negative or pessimistic is is maybe give them a potential outcome that helps them to identify what could be seen or where it could be um, and highlight the benefits and opportunities. I'd probably say those, those are the areas that I would look at. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. I will put those into action. That's all that we have time for today, but it's been very lively, hasn't it, Stephanie? Um, it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Ruth. There's so much information there to take away. Uh, really appreciate your time and experience and expertise. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, there's lots of people saying thank you. Great session. Great yeah. session, Ruth. Thank um, you, everybody. So have a great rest of the day, and we'll be circulating the recording soon.